Aloha, welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. I'm your adventure guide, Bear Wozniak. Today we have as our guest, Kramer Soderman, who's written a book uh, about Jesus and about basketball. He's a, he's a basketball coach. He's a, he was a college basketball player, father of three children, and uh, living that life, that full life that Jesus has for us. We're going to talk about what basketball has to do with Jesus. We'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Kickstart that engine and roll thunder with the pack. Explore the grittiness of manly spirituality. Gain traction in the virtues. Zoop up your spiritual engine by turning adversity into adventure. Now here's Bear Wozniak. Let's ride. Aloha. Welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. This is Bear Wozniak. I'm your adventure guide, my co-adventure guide, Joining us today is Kramer Soderman. He's a basketball coach, and he's written a new book, Fill Your Cup for Christ, uh, Basketball, Basketball. My son, Jeremiah, who, you know, just an incredible surfer. He surfed, dropped in 85-foot waves. His love as a young man was basketball. Basketball is the, is the, is the true sport of real athletes. You know, football, you can get away with being a bit of a Neanderthal and a knuckle dragger, but basketball is true athleticism. And, uh, you know, I went to Baylor, so I'm a big basketball fan. We have a great women's team and a great men's team. But my dad, uh, Deacon Greg Wozniak, was actually a high school basketball coach when he was young. He played college basketball. He was six foot four. His brother was six foot three. His other brother was about six foot two. One of his brothers played for the, back in those days, the Minneapolis Lakers. And uh, so basketball is kind of in my family. When I was a young boy, my dad had uh, set up a basketball inside this our house because a little basketball uh, net because uh, when I was about four or five years old, I was living in North Dakota, and so not, not sunny California, and I had to make so many baskets before I could have dinner. I remember that, but I just remember going. Uh, the 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 gym was only a couple blocks away, and walking over there and hearing the sound of the whistles and the 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 gym. Uh, floor, the sound of the basketball on the gym floor, and the echoing uh, inside the gym, and the squeaking of the tennis shoes, and and the sweaty locker room, and those those were the guys back in the day that I think were going to go drive in their Chevy, go down by the levee, you know, the those old those, driving those. It was back in the I don't know, I was probably in the late fifties or early sixties that I was I was around basketball players, and my dad actually coached. Uh, two state championship teams for the division that they were in in North Dakota, and not one of his guys was over six feet tall, but they won with just hustle and technique. And so we learned a lot about, you know, what what I learned a lot about by watching that, uh, what desire can do. And I was never a good basketball player, but I was really bad until they, but they put me in the team when they needed something bad to happen to the other team because I would just go crazy on them in my defensive, you know, capabilities. So... I'm a basketball uh, fan and uh, very happy to have with us today. Uh, we have with us Kramer Soderberg, who is bold enough to uh, to write a book, which is not the easiest thing to do, and it's called "Fill Your Cup for Christ." Welcome to the show, Kramer. Bear, thanks for having me, man. It's a pleasure. So you're not like me, where I dribbled the ball. I actually did dribble the ball. I stole it, <laughs> and then I dribbled it to the wrong basket. And shot, and because I'm such a bad shot, I missed. Right? You, you, you never must did. have been the enforcer. You know, the enforcer <laughs> on the team who did the dirty work for everybody. Yeah, right? I was kind of like, uh, yeah. I, and even to this day, I use my subtlety in the same way. That that's that's, that's right. subtlety is just the bullet in the china closet. But right. you know, I'm sure you've never done anything uh, kind of hor- horrific on the basketball court, or what? What? You know, what's your YouTube moment or your 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 memory that you have? Like, I'm sure you have a million of them, but. Yeah, yeah, I, I had a I had a mean side to me, a competitive side for sure. But you know, I was I was the five five ten guy who was just uh, scrappy that way. wasn't very athletic, but uh, I made it up for it with my with my scrappiness and all that. So I have I have a lot of memories uh, on the basketball court. But probably the most embarrassing memory I had um, was was from my junior year of college and. I played um, my junior and senior year for my dad. He was my my head coach. Um, and your dad is of, your dad is 
Um, yeah, my dad's a longtime college basketball coach. Um, he's currently the assistant at the University of Virginia. Um, you know, the reigning national champ since they didn't have a champion this year. So they yeah, they Baylor was on its way stay. and got shot down That's by right. the. But he, you guys won a national national champion. Ship, or yep, he won, he won a national, a national championship, championship last, uh, last last time they played and what's it his out. Name? And what's his name again? Brad Soderberg. Yeah, so you got uh, it yeah. in your blood, man, that competitive streak. Yeah, I do. And he, he was a fiery guy and really competitive. So um, back to the story, my, my junior year, we had a scrimmage game against a team that we were supposed to beat, you know, it's a team that we were supposed to whoop up on. And we scrimmaged them, and they happened to beat us by a point in the first half. And instead of taking us down to the locker room, my dad lines up the whole team on the bench in front of the people that were there, you know, in front of the, the fans. And he pulls his chair directly in front of me, about Ooh. five inches from my face. And uh. he proceeds to chew me out for the next eight minutes until halftime was over. And just, you, you're spoiled. You think you're better than everybody else. You don't, you can't play hard. Yeah, because you came that. in as, you came in as kind of like the, the hired gun because you 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 moved in from a a, a, a yeah. different level. So yeah, when you I came into town, you were like you were like the hired gun coming into town, right? Right. I was a Division One transfer, so I think he was kind of making a statement to the team that hey, just just because you you know played Division One basketball doesn't mean that you don't have to play hard. It was a humbling experience for me, but it was it was a profound move by my dad, a really great coaching move because he knew I was going to respond to it well. And I was, I was angrier than you can imagine at my dad, but I didn't say anything. I sat there. And then when the second half started, I went out with a vengeance. I put on a full court press by myself and got (laughs) three steals and three layups to start the half. And we probably won the second half by 20 or 30. Um, But it was, I think it was a statement for our, for my teammates and for our team that we're all going to play hard and our best player can take criticism and his dad is going to be harder on him than he is on everybody else. Well, let's talk about that right now in the, in the situation in the world today in America. Uh, of course we have listeners all, all over the world. Same thing everywhere. There's too many lukewarm Christians out there and oh, those that absolutely. are the most gifted. And sometimes those are out on the speaking tour and, you know, have written the latest book in some ways they've become their own. They've become sloth, slothful in their own, uh, you know, walk with Jesus. And I can see God the Father right now with each man listening to this broadcast with with everyone else on the bench as a good father uh, did with, with Kramer, looking him in the face and basically taking him out to the woodshed and just chewing him out. Are you yeah. really living up to the mission that God has for you? God has given you gifts and abilities and opportunities and and are, are you going to are you going to sit and complain about the state of the world, the fact that uh, Christian liberties are being are being lost right and left, the fact that the the the, the world's moral uh, moral compass has been totally broken, and that there's that there's kind of an any everything goes uh, uh, truth relative type truth out there. Are you gonna are you gonna make a comeback? Are you gonna get determined and get fired up again and renew your faith and get deeper into the faith and be get determined in your spiritual walk and get out there and steal three 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 balls in, in it, it going right at, right into the second half and make three layups because God you know God Jesus said I wish that you were hot or warm but because you're lukewarm I will I will explode vomit you out of my mouth. The lukewarm Catholic out there, this isn't the time to be doing uh, to uh, be be being lazy. This is your moment. God the Father sitting toe to toe with you, just like Kramer's dad did, and saying you're better than this. It's time for you to get some fire in the belly. What did when you did that, Kramer? What was the response of the rest of the team when you went? Yeah, on? I think. Yeah, I think I think it's a it's a profound response when you know when a leader or when one of the better players on the team doesn't respond back with attitude or anger towards the coach, but instead responds with action um, and action for the betterment of the team. Um, so I think it was it was again it was before our season started. So I think it set a tone for the rest of the season, knowing that everybody was going to have to play at a certain level, um, and that I thought I think that helped us the rest of that year. Um, and it was it was a good year for us, great year. Well, we need that right now, man. It's like the second half, you know. I mean, right now, the churches. You, you, if you look at the state of the world today, and you look at the church, it's like we're down for the count. It's like yeah, the lights really are, are about to go out. But the fact is, we got a father who's our coach, and uh, you, you should be the one. 
like Kramer really did this. That that guy used to be me that would stand next to the coach and say, send me in. That used yep. to be me. And that's what you did when you wrote this book. You're like, I got so much fire. What am I going to do with all this love and compassion I have for the, for, for the world and my love for Jesus? You wrote this book, which was kind of like your manifesto to saying, I'm getting in the game. Send me in, coach, because you're mm-hmm. out speaking now and having more opportunity to share the gospel. Yeah, that's right. And when you talk about lukewarmness, that, that was me as a Christian for majority of my life, all, uh, all through college, you know, and I think like most cradle Catholics, you know, we, we grow up, you know, a little bit bored, uninterested, um, just sleepwalking through things. I went to mass because my parents told me to, but, but I wasn't on fire about it. And I think, I think like you said, lukewarmness is, is the worst thing we can be. And unless we find that passion for our faith um, and, and go out and spread it to others, we're not, we're not filling, um, what God wants us to do. We're not, we're not taking advantage of our potential as, as Christians and, and taking advantage of the talents that he gave us to use for his sake. And the thing about it, Kramer, it's like, that's such a great analogy to the basketball team, because we are a team and, yep, and it's not just body. the players that are the team, the coaches and the assistants and the, 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 the equipment manager and the physical therapist, we're a team. And yes. so if you're a man and you're like, well, I'm a good Catholic, I go to church on Sundays, or I, I, but, but I, I don't really need to participate with other Christians. If you're not part of a team, you're languishing. You're, if you're a lone wolf out there, you're already losing. You're a target, and you're being picked off, and you know it because you know there's personal sin in your life that, you, that, that you're ashamed of and can't overcome. So, men, uh, you need to come and be part of the team, become part of a team. There's Go to your church. There's different programs like That Man Is You and and other programs that you can become involved with with other men. You can go to deepadventure.com and join Bears Man Cave. We have a group of men there that challenge, equip, and mobilize each other. We have our, our periodic Zoom video meetups. Uh, can, can we get a place, Kramer, where they can find you? What is your, what is your website? Yeah, yeah. So my website is www.kramersoderberg.com, and there you can um, see a bunch of different media things I've done, but also get my book there and learn a little bit more about me. Um, so like you mentioned, I'm trying to get more involved with speaking opportunities. Well, you're not going to have a choice. You're not going to have a choice <laughs> because so. the Holy Spirit's giving you that nudge, and uh, it's going to it's you're going to go off like a rocket. This is the Bear Wozniak Adventure. You can go to deepadventure.com to find out more about us. We'll be right back with Kramer Soderberg, basketball coach. Hey, man, I don't want you to miss out on your free stuff at deepadventure.com. Go there and subscribe to our weekly email newsletter. You get free video content, including the Bear Wozniak radio show, video version on YouTube before it even airs on EWTN. And you can follow us on all of our social media. Go to deepadventure.com and subscribe. Get your free stuff. And if you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to press the subscribe button and ring that little bell. Don't miss out. Mahalo for your kokua in supporting us. Deep Adventure Ministries is grateful to you, our listeners, for supporting the Bear Wozniak Adventure radio show at deepadventure.com. We would not be able to bring you our radio show with its uniquely powerful and gritty outreach without your help. You can become part of our pack. You can support our ministry by going to patreon.com forward slash Bear Wozniak or by just going to deepadventure.com and clicking on the Patreon link and become a part of our outreach. That's deepadventure.com. Once again, mahalo for your kokua. This is a warning. The Bear Wozniak Adventure is dangerous. The radical change Bear challenges you to is not for wimps. Change this station now to a soft rock station before it's too late. You've been warned. Now, here is Bear Wozniak. Aloha, this is the Bear Wozniak Adventure. We want to invite the the women out there to go to deepadventure.com and become part of our ministry. We really received a word from the Lord the other day. I was talking with our people, Fuzadi, who handle our social media, and she, they said, you know, you got to reach out to the mama bears out there. And I go, mama bears? And I had in my mind the mama bear in the Goldilocks story. But then my oldest son, Jeremiah, came in the next day and said, Dad, remember when we had a cabin in Montana, how fierce those mama bears were? 
You know, when that we we I came across them a couple of times. There's nothing more fierce than a mama bear. And uh, one time, my dad actually stepped into the this clearing in the woods, and there was a big log on the other side of the clearing, and he realized it wasn't a log; it was a grizzly bear. And then he looked to the right, and he saw two cubs. He had come between a grizzly bear, a sow, a mama bear, and her cubs, and it was like back get small, start backing away, don't make eye contact. <laughs> so we have a place for you mama bears. We have a new page for you, and we're going to begin to arm you on how to protect your, your cubs and how to, how to uh, minister to the other men, the men in your, in your life so you can have an, an impact. We, we have the tools that are gritty and real enough for you to be able to use to help, help win, win your men for Christ. Remember, women are like kindling. They catch on fire fast. Men kind of take a little bit longer to burn, but when they do, they burn hot and they burn long. So, go, Mama Bears, go to deepadventure.com and, and sign up sign up with us for our newsletter. Uh, the other things that we're doing. We have Kramer Soderberg with us. He's written a book, Fill Your Cup for Christ. Hey, Kramer, what was that yeah. story you told about when you were young and your, your dad was coaching, I guess, a, ca- a basketball camp about the three different yeah. kind of basketball players? You're going to meet, he said, yep. you're going to meet three basketball players today. That's right. That's right. And this and this was this story um, is the premise of the whole title of the book. This this was this was what inspired the book was this story, and it actually has inspired me my entire life. Um, so when I was in sixth grade, my dad was the head coach at St. Louis University um, in St. Louis, Missouri, and he was putting on a, a kid basketball camp, you know, just with grade school kids, and he brought us all together at center court and was going to give us a little talk, you know, and I was you know, annoyed by it. Cause I didn't want to listen to my dad talk again. And, you know, I just wanted to play. <laughs> um, but anyways, he told us, he said, I'm going to introduce you guys to three players. And I got kind of excited with that. Cause I thought he was going to bring some of his college guys out and, you know, mm-hmm. do some dunks or whatever. But instead he had a backpack on and he pulled out three different size cups. One was a, like a 64 ounce guzzler that you get from a gas station. One was a, you know, a 12 ounce drinking glass. And one was like a Dixie cup. And, he went on to, you know, tell a story and, and kind of give us the idea that he said, I don't care how much potential you have, i.e. how big your cup is. Well, well t- tell, well, us, tell us about the big cup. What was the big cup skills? Yeah. So the big cup, he, he said, the big cup, he, this is Big John, and he's about 6'8". Um, he's really athletic. He can jump high. He's got all the potential in the world. And then the next cup, he said, this is Jimmy. And he's, he's about six, three, not as athletic as John, but he's still got long arms and he's strong. And then the little guy, he said, this is little Tony. And he's only about five ten. Um, he's not very fast, not very athletic. Um, isn't very strong. And he went on to say, um, big John doesn't work very hard. And then he took a a pitcher of water and he poured about two ounces of water into that big cup. And he said, Jimmy, he's, he works pretty hard, but he doesn't do anything extra. And he filled Jimmy's cup up about halfway. And then he said, but little Tony, he's different. He shows up early. He stays late. He works as hard as he can, whether the coach is looking or the coach isn't looking. And he proceeded to fill that little tiny Dixie cup all the way to the top and water overflowed off the sides. And it was an image that was just ingrained in my head and it inspired me as a sixth grade kid and, and drove my athletic career for for the rest of the way. Um, and actually that day on the ride home, my dad, um, kind of poked me and said, Hey, you know, that story I told today, I said, Oh yeah, I loved it. That was really good. He said, just so you know, you're little Tony, you're the little cup. Um, and I think he knew that I wasn't going to be tall. I wasn't going to be athletic. He knew I wanted to be a Division One college basketball player and how hard that was going to be. And the only way for me to achieve that was to fill my little cup. Um, and that's what I did. But only later on in my life did I realize how, how, the, how much that story relates to my whole life as a husband, as a father, and, and as a Catholic man. That, that is, in my opinion, the way to live your life, by filling your cup. Yeah, God, God has a call for each of us. Uh, and, yep. and and we we call we say that the most radical thing you can do in life is abandon yourself to the wild adventure of God's will. How many mm-hmm. people have not even scratched the surface of of knowing God's will? Yeah, their their, their life is 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 just this kind of routine, uh, and never never um, never having of asking God for a vision or a dream and never stepping out in faith. The most radical thing you can do is abandon yourself to God's will, which is also to say his love. But when you're right there, 
in God's will, you get to watch miracles happen. You get to see stuff happen. You get to do the stuff. God, God's still in the in the in the in the miracle biz. You know, in ministry, it's so often we're like, how are we going to pay this next bill, for example, or how are we going to get? Uh, you know, I'd love to have Archbishop Wensky ride with us in one of our episodes, and then suddenly the door just opens, pop, 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 like that, and you know you had nothing to do with it. But, but Kramer, I worked hard. I prepared. And so, and I, I had that sense that this is the next thing God wants to do. Do so, I did all that I could do, and then God opens up the doors. You can't force them open, but you can be right at the door knocking, and you can be ready when the Lord opens the doors. But we gotta look at the potential God's given each of us. And I'm just so sick and tired of the lukewarm Catholic who who just warms the bench. You know, it's yeah. a bench sitter, as you say in basketball, sits in the pew. Yeah, I think if most of us are being honest, they're that that big cup that has a tiny bit of water in it. And and that in my opinion is failure. That when when you look at your cup at the end of your life and you have a small amount of water in it, that's failure. But if you at the end of your life whether you have a big cup or a small cup, it's filled to the top, that's success. Whether you fail in life, whether you're an ultra success in the world's eyes or not, whether you stumble all the time um, or not, if you just do your best to fill your cup, your potential to the top, that is success in, in my eyes, and that is success in God's eyes. And and the thing is, is what it, what is uh, success? You know, my dad was being a coach. He eventually made a living as a professional motivational speaker, and then became a Catholic deacon. Uh, and the very first thing you have to choose is, you know, what 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 goal are you pursuing? And you talked about the goal of love. And in the book, you talk about this 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 thing with the beam. Uh, yeah. Can yep. you, can you talk? Great story. Yeah. Tell us tell us what that tell, give us the lesson of the beam. So so the um, the idea behind this is when you're chasing a goal, and for us and for us Catholics, it, our goal is heaven. There there's there's no getting around that. That's that's the greatest goal that we can all chase. But to to chase a goal, you have to have great motivation. And, and if you don't have the motivation to attack your goal, you're going to, you're going to drop out. You're going to step back. You're going to not want to go through the difficulties. And in my opinion, and what I wrote in my book is the only true motivation is love. There, there's no other motivation that is going to get you to where you want to go. You could be motivated by uh, money, pleasure, power, whatever it may be. But at some point, something's going to stop you. So the story of, of the being love is, again, is the motivation another, that 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 breaks all barriers that drives you that drives you. That's, That's right. the real. And, I mean, that that if you choose to to abandon yourself to that, yep. you, it'll, it'll break through any barrier. OK, so now so now describe the story of the beam. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, again, another story that that my dad profoundly passed on to me. He was a uh, he was at a Final Four convention um, when he was a young coach, and there was a there was a presenter putting on a, a show kind of about just chasing your dreams and the the worldly you know the worldly success and all that comes with being a high level college coach. And he called my dad up on stage and he said, um, "Imagine there's a balance beam on the stage and there's uh, five hundred dollars on the balance beam. Would you walk across it and get the five hundred dollars?" My dad said, "Yeah, of course." I'll go get the five hundred dollars. Said, okay, good. Now there's there's two basketball rims ten feet high. I'm going to put that same balance beam across those rims. There's a thousand dollars across there. Would you walk it to get the thousand dollars? He said, yeah. You know, I think I think I could shimmy across there without getting hurt and get the thousand dollars. Said, okay, good. Now I have the two uh, and then World Trade Center buildings. I put the beam across there and I put a million dollars in the middle. Would you walk it? He said, no way. I wouldn't walk it. He said, what about 2 million, 3 million, 20 million, a billion? And he said, no, I would never walk it. He said, okay, Brad, your son, Kramer, he's out in the middle of the beam on the World Trade Centers. Would you walk and get him? My dad said, in a second. And the point of that story is, again, money isn't the motivation and nothing else is. Love is the motivation. A father loves his son. And he will walk across that beam and risk his life to get his son because of love. Not even not hesitate. Not because of money. Not even hesitate. And and that's the idea of the motivation. That was the idea behind the story is that if you want to chase heaven, if you want to be, you know, go after spiritual greatness, you better fall in love with Christ first. Because mm. if you're not head over heels in love with him, then you're not going to make it. Something's going to stop you. 
you know, there's going to be a trial. There's going to be suffering. Going to daily mass is going to get too hard. All these things are going to stop you unless you're in love with Christ. We're talking with Kramer Soderberg, the author of the new book, Fill Your Cup, Fill Your Cup for Christ. And where can people find this? Yeah, they can go to my website. It's available there, and it's also available on Amazon.com. Um, I'm just hoping it can spread the word and, and help a lot of people uh, become saints. What's your website again? www.kramer, K-R-A-M-E-R, and then Soderberg, S-O-D-E-R-B-E-R-G.com. Yeah, so get this book. Get one. this book. You put mama bears out there. Get this book for your for your young the young men in your life. We'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak adventure. That's right. Deep Adventure Ministries is grateful to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for underwriting the Bear Wozniak Adventure on EWTN. Notre Dame Federal Credit Union provides car loans, mortgages, SBA loans, and depository accounts nationwide, as well as 24-hour support. Go to deepadventure.com to find their link or go to NotreDameFCU.com. Mahalo to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for making the Bear Wozniak adventure possible. Men, yes, we mean you. Go to deepadventure.com and check out Bear's Man Cave, a men's only Facebook group. Join the pack with other men as they challenge and inspire one another to manly virtue. Plus, you can dialogue with us in our regular video chat meetups. Plus, get your exclusive content. Join at deepadventure.com. That's deepadventure.com. Aloha. Welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. We invite you to go to our website, deepadventure.com, and sign up for our newsletter because you get free stuff when you do that. You get actually a free audio book of my most recent book, Deep Adventure, The Way of Heroic Virtue. So it's pretty cool. You got you get you have access to it and you can share it with others. But it's a it's a great way to uh, to read a book is to listen to books. I, I listen to I'm always listening to books. So uh, we make that available to you if you go to our website, deepadventure.com and subscribe. We got with that uh, with our guest today, basketball coach, former college basketball player Kramer Soderberg, his book, Fill Your Cup for Christ. We're talking about love being your the, the greatest motivator there is in, in, in life. What, uh, and that it's that love for Christ that's so important. Talk to us about your own personal journey towards falling in love with Jesus. Yeah, yeah, it was it was a long journey for me. Like I mentioned earlier, you know, as a cradle Catholic, I just went to mass because mom and dad told me to. You know, I wasn't on fire about it. I was just sleepwalking through things. In college, it got worse, you know, as it does for most kids. You, you go to college and mom and dad aren't holding your hand anymore, so you stop going to mass. Um, you start getting involved in things that you shouldn't. Um, and then only once I started, you know, getting closer to getting married and started having kids, did I say, okay, um, this, this might be something that I need to get focused on. And a couple good books got me really, um, falling in love with Jesus. What and, books and were that's those? Where, um, two books, mostly, um, Joshua and the shack. And they were both just fictional yeah. books, you know, just fictional books that, kind of focus more on Jesus, the person, um, yeah. and less on other things. And that's what I needed. I needed to fall in love with, with the person of Christ. So it stirred and, up, it, stirred, it kind of threw all the cards up the air because that's such unique perspective. It just kind of threw things up in the air for you. And you begin to yeah. realize it's almost like when you're raised in the church, sometimes you're just kind of hardened to it all. You don't really, you, you don't, exactly. you can't see past it. And so exactly. then what happened? Yeah. So, so it was, um, after I started falling in love with Christ, it was kind of that honeymoon period where, you know, I felt so good. I was on fire about my faith, ready to go. Nothing was going to stop me. And then out of nowhere, uh, a, a pretty significant trial in my life came um, where I was working for my dad and he got the, the assistant job at um, the University of Virginia. And um, I was out of the job, you know, and that kind of went into a, a five month period of me searching for a job, couldn't find one sent in resumes, made calls. My dad was making calls and we just couldn't find a job. Um, but that trial for me united me closer to Christ than, than anything else could have. Um, and that's why suffering is so good. Well, how um, did you, how did you, how do you mean it, it united you to Christ? What was, how did that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, you know, I think for all of us, any trial makes you realize how, um, how much, 
control you don't have. Mm. Um, we all, we all think that we're in control of, of what's going on and that I can handle my situation and whatever's thrown at me, I'm going to take care of it. But for me, that, that time made me realize that I was insignificant and incapable of finding a job. And it, it forced full dependence and full surrender. Like you mentioned earlier, um, because I got to a point where it's like, I've done everything I can do to find a job and it's not happening. So Lord, I extend my hands to you. If you want to give me a job, you'll give me a job. If you don't, you won't. Um, and that, that time just was so profound because my, my love that started kind of immaturely was, was maturated in that summer and our unity grew, my trust grew, my dependence grew. Um, all through that trial. And although it was so difficult that, that five months, um, it was so good looking back. It was the best summer of my life. Did you continue to, uh, what was your prayer life during that time? It was deep. It was a deep prayer life because my wife was still working. We had just bought a house. We just had our son and she was working and we couldn't afford daycare. So I had to stay home with my son who couldn't talk. So I was basically home all day by myself and he was taking three naps a day. So it was basically all day prayer. It was all day. What do you, what do you mean by prayer? And what do you mean by prayer and meditation? Yeah, I, I started to learn and started to test myself to try to be aware of Christ all the time. And it kind of goes back to the Bible verse of praying without ceasing. And that's what I wanted to try to do was pray without ceasing and meaning be aware of Christ every second of every day and, and not lose that connection, that communion with the Lord. And I don't know if it's possible to do it every second of every day, but when you strive to do it, mm. every, everything gets better. You're more thankful. You're more joyful. You're more at peace. When, when you are aware of Christ in your life, even if bad stuff is happening, it, it's smooth were, sailing. Were you, were you reading the Bible or, or what were, were you, what were, were you reading? books yeah or? yeah yeah i was reading i was reading a lot um reading books um bible one of the books that i read that kind of started me on this awareness thing was practicing his presence um it was it was the journal entries of frank labrock labach and brother lawrence really good book i was wondering because um, that sounded exactly like that book yes highly suggest that to any catholic it's so good it, it was a it was a game changer for me and then the bible for sure and i started journal entering a lot and mm -hmm. in my book actually the second quarter i call it quarter to make it a sports theme but the second section of my book is is called the trial and that goes through my my trial but i have all of my journal entries from that summer kind of splattered in throughout the section to, to give you an inside look on of my vulnerability and you know the the depression that i went through and, and all that stuff but um best thing that it, ever happened to you is losing that job best thing that ever happened to me no i know like i had the, a similar experience i was a young man i think i had two children and uh was working for a new york bank and they decided they're going to pull the plug on their los angeles office which is where i worked and they said you can come back to new york or here's a little 10 week of your salary, here's your silver streamer. There was no way I was going to be moving to, to, to Manhattan with my family. So suddenly I was like, wow, you know, and I, I, I was working in a position that was very rare, very few job openings and what I was particularly good at. And, uh, and so I remember I, I, I went, I sent out all those resumes and, uh, and then I went, uh, but I went down to the beach every morning with my surfboard kind of as my desk. And I read through the entire Bible, the New Testament, and then the Old Testament, and then the New Testament again. And by the time I was done, I had that a sense for what I should do, and that was to start my CPA practice. And, and I would have never had the boldness to do that if it hadn't been for losing my job, because I wouldn't have put my family at risk like that. And so that started my CPA practice, opened up the door to give me a lot more freedom to pursue my, my, the adventurous side of my life and to pursue, um, you know, ministry. So that thing that seems to be so hard right now for you, uh, whatever it is you're facing, it'll be the best thing that ever happened to you, uh, whether it's physical or job or whatever, if you turn and abandon yourself to God's yeah. will, just like Job. Like I, I love in one of our, one of our long ride home shows, we talk about the beauty of the horses running from the book of Proverbs. And uh, and uh, and one of the things in 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 Job it says, did you did you know did you make the horses run like this? You know, uh, the power the power of that beautiful majestic animal 
God is in charge. But one of the things he does is he, 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 he breaks you like someone breaks a horse. You don't crush a horse. You don't break his, his, uh, his spirit. But there's kind of a brokenness to his will that needs to happen so that your, your will becomes the will of God. Um, it's like Moses. Moses, what do you have in your hand? I have my stick. You know, it's the, it's, I'm the shepherd. It's my shepherd's staff. It's kind of my prestige to God. It's the way I make a living. It's been with me. It's kind of like part of me, and God's throw it down. Whatever you're clinging to, your job or your prestige or whatever, your honor, your wealth, your money, throw it down. Because what happened when Moses threw it down is it became a hissing snake, and he saw it for what it was. Mm. But then God said to him, Moses, pick it up, you know, pick it up by its tail, <laughs> which is not the way you pick up a snake. And he did. And it says that that time then the, the rod of Aaron, the rod of Moses became the rod of God. So. If you're, if you're a man of God seeking God's will, there will come a time in your life when there will be a death of the vision. Joseph was told he would lead the nation. He would be in charge of his family. And then next thing you know, he's down in Egypt. And worse than that, he becomes a, a, a prisoner in jail. Mm. And, uh, and so there are – David was anointed king. And next thing you know, he's running from King Saul, hiding in the cave of Adullam. Um, when God calls you and gives you a vision, there's often a time of dying to that vision. So that when you let go of it, when it's restored, it's like in its resurrection power and glory, and then it's in, it's it's in God's power in in the in the power of Jesus, that that is that you are, you begin to move. Jesus was you know the the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and yet he died. But when he when he resurrected, it wasn't like he had a resuscitated body like Lazarus did. He had a glorified resurrected body, and that's what happens when God gives you a vision and a call. He, he, everything else just seemed to be working just fine, and then suddenly everything falls apart. That's that total death to self. That's that total moment in time when you say, Lord, as hard as it is to serve you, it's harder not to. I surrender everything to you, my health, my wealth, my job, my marriage, everything, Lord. Abandon yourself to God's will. And then in his timing, if that thing that you are pursuing was his will, he will resurrect it, and if it's not, leave it dead on the ground. So you, you die to things. A lot of them get left behind. But the thing that Jesus points to and says, pick that up, you know, I think of rock musicians that I've led to the Lord, and they, they, there were seasons in their lives where some of them had to lay it, all, lay it down, never to pick it up again, but some that did pick it up again, then God used in, in a glor powerful, glorful, glor powerful way. So get ready to surrender all to Jesus. And then let his will be done in your life. And you'll find peace and you'll find uh, fulfillment because you're fulfilling God's will. We'll be right back with Kramer Soderberg. He's a basketball, former college basketball player and a college basketball coach. you digging on his new book, Fill Your Cup for Christ. We'll be right back with more of the deep, uh, with the Bear Wozniak adventure. Hey, man. I don't want you to miss out on your free stuff at deepadventure.com. Go there and subscribe to our weekly email newsletter. You get free video content, including the Bear Wozniak radio show, video version on YouTube before it even airs on EWTN. And you can follow us on all of our social media. Go to deepadventure.com and subscribe. Get your free stuff. And if you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to press the subscribe button and ring that little bell. Don't miss out. That's right. Deep Adventure Ministries is grateful to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for underwriting the Bear Wozniak Adventure on EWTN. Notre Dame Federal Credit Union provides car loans, mortgages, SBA loans, and depository accounts nationwide, as well as 24-hour support. Go to deepadventure.com to find their link or go to notredamefcu.com. Mahalo to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for making the Bear Wozniak adventure possible. Mahalo for your kokua in supporting us. Deep Adventure Ministries is grateful to you, our listeners, for supporting the Bear Wozniak adventure radio show at deepadventure.com. We would not be able to bring you our radio show with its uniquely powerful and gritty outreach without your help. You can become part of our pack. You can support our ministry by going to patreon.com forward slash Bear Wozniak or by just going to deepadventure.com and clicking on the Patreon link and become a part of our outreach. 
That's deepadventure.com. Once again, mahalo for your kokua. This is a warning. The Bear Wozniak Adventure is dangerous. The radical change Bear challenges you to is not for wimps. Change this station now to a soft rock station before it's too late. You've been warned. Now, here is Bear Wozniak. Aloha. Welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Hey, Coach, we're talking with Kramer Soderberg. So when you start a basketball game, uh, do you have? Do you just kind of say, okay, guys, go out there and play, or do you have actually a, a game plan? We always have a game plan, Bear. We, we study it before the game. We watch film. We prepare. We write it on the whiteboard, and then we try to execute it. Well, you, you mentioned in your book the game plan that God has for you, uh, the n- nature, people, trials. How does God – How does God? what is God's game plan for us? Yeah, I mean, I think – I think God's game plan for us is what we discussed in the, in the past, you know, in the past segment there is surrendering to his will. And it's, it's so hard to do that. I think some of us need gentle nudges and other us need big shoves. Um, but I think just as God has a game plan um, for us, we have to have a game plan um, to, to do that. You know, we can't just say, okay, I'm going to surrender to God's will. Um, and then not have a plan on how I'm going to do that. How do you do that? How do you do that? Yeah, I I think, I think everybody has, you know, has to set up their, their own specific way, uh, of doing it. Um, but, um, a great, a great way that, that I presented in my book is again, you know, another thing that my dad taught me, um, his, we had three rules on our college basketball team. The three rules were show up, show up on time and do the best you can. Those were our three rules. Um, and I think that transcends so well to the spiritual life. First and foremost, you have to show up. You, you got to show up to your prayer life. You got to show up to mass. You got to show up to daily mass. You got to show up maybe with a rosary, whatever it may be. You got to show up. Do you have um, a daily routine to your prayer life? Yeah, I do. I, or at least I try to. And with kids, sometimes it gets knocked yeah. sideways, but I try to get it as best I can and, and go what, into. Uh, what is that? What is that? So on, yeah, on Mondays and Wednesdays, um, I always go to daily mass on Tuesdays and Thursdays. uh, I go to adoration at the, at the hospital adoration chapel. Unfortunately with this COVID stuff, it's been closed for the last few months. So I'm going crazy that way. Um, but whenever I open my eyes, um, I always try to make a daily offering to the Lord and say, you know, thank you for waking me up. Um, I'm offering this day to you help me get through it. Um, and then I always try to do uh, a little bit of spiritual reading at some point in the day. Usually it's at night, you know, after work. What do you mean by spiritual reading? Um, whatever it may be. Um, you know, sometimes it's um, a book. Sometimes it's, um, you know, just more of the Bible that I didn't get to read, you know, as far as the daily readings go on the mass um, of that day. But it, it's always something that is is meant to draw me closer to Christ. As a young um, so. man, how do you how do you lead your family in, 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 into the Lord? You have three young children, Andrea, your yep. wife. Yep. Yeah. I think I think um, you know for for all parents out there, um, this I can I can say this from my experience. Um, a lot of what you say to your kids is going to go in one ear out the other. Um, and especially when do they get to that age of 13 and 14, they're just going to start rebelling and ignoring you. But, but your e- example never goes unnoticed, never goes unnoticed. Um, and I tell my dad often that um, I fell away from the Catholic church, you know, through high school and college. But when I got older, I started to think back, why did dad go to daily mass? Why did he go to adoration? Why was he reading from his, you know, his daily devotional each day? And those questions, those examples that happened long ago came back to me and I asked why. And then I started to pursue those questions and and started to do those things. So the first thing for my kids is I just try to be an example. Dad, where are you going this morning? I'm going to daily mass today. Oh, okay. And they, no questions after that, but they hear that. And mm-hmm. dad, what are you reading at the kitchen table when I wake up? Oh, well, I'm reading my Bible here, you know, and really, okay. really, is that really true? That's so beautiful. Yeah. And it, that and when they wake it, up, they see their dad having his prayer yeah, time. Yeah. And I, and I, I want that. I want 
that example to be there. And of course we say our prayers before dinner and, you know, when they ask questions, we keep going. Um, you know, we take them to mass, all those things that we want them to do. We want them to do, but most, especially for me, I want them to see, I want them to see me and me and Andrew and my wife doing these things so that later in their life, they'll say, why did mom and dad do that? And then they'll pursue it on their own. Yeah. You lead by example. And you know, your wife's nickname is really cool. Her nickname is honor. Mm. Right? That, yep. like, that scripture was honor your mother and your father. I think one of the greatest <laughs> things a man can do for his children is to honor their mom. Yeah. Yep. Yep. That's it. it. It's again, it's the example, whether it's a, you know, a big hug when you come home from work or, you know, giving her a kiss on the cheek. Um, boys see how to love their future wives by the way their husband or their father loves their mother. Daughters learn how they should be loved when they get married mm. or when they are going through dating or whatever it may be by how their their father loves their mother. And I think in our society, the family has, is, is falling apart. And because the family is falling apart, our society is falling apart. And the yes. church teaches that. That's I mean, it. the Catholic That's church it. has said that, that the family is the root of everything. And when the family falls apart, everything else is. When you see these it. riots in the street, I got to tell you, my heart just bleeds one, one thing. And that is fatherless children. These people, not everyone, but so many of them, I just have a feeling they didn't have, they weren't really fathered. You know, they might have had a, a genderless sort of male in their house who didn't, uh, who was kind of a Casper milk toast. But so many of it just seems like, uh, it's almost like daddy issues. It's like they're angry with daddy, so they're angry at the world. And I just think of how, how important a, a good father is. You know, Archbishop Chaput, when we were at the Knapp Institute a couple of years ago, someone raised their hand. What is the key right now for evangelization? He said, get married, have lots of kids, and raise them up in the Lord. That's how you change the world, the domestic church. You're, you're on the way to having a basketball team there, aren't you, in your family? you got three kids. and Three kids under six, and we're— So you need a couple more, and you got a, you got a team. Right. Well, if that's you already right. do, part, you got the five of you. That's right. we got five right now, but— but I'm old and retired, but we're put, we're not playing man to man every anymore. We're playing zone against three, so we might as well <laughs> we might as well have a couple more, you know, and, and make it make That's it. That's hysterical. Five. That's exactly right. When it, when there's only one kid, it's two on one, and then there's two kids and one parent for each kid. But once you go to three kids, yep. you got to play zone now defense. <laughs> now you got to play zone, and you're you're in big trouble then. That's so, exactly it, right. It's good though. I, I, it's being a parent is the hardest thing you'll ever do, but it is the greatest joy in the world. I, I really, really love it. What do you? How do you spend time with uh, Andrea? Do you get time with her? Special time, time dates or anything like that, or is that up? Yeah, pretty, we try to um, as best we can. You know, each night once the kids go to bed, we try to spend time together. Um, dates become harder and harder, especially we're living in Decatur where we don't have any family members. Our family all lives in Wisconsin and, and Missouri. So we don't get as many dates as we'd like, but we try to do little in-home dates, you know, so we'll kind of yeah. alternate, alternate weeks and, and take one, she'll, she'll organize the date at home and I'll organize really? the next week. Yep. So See, that's, I did a, yeah. I did a little mini golf. I did a little mini golf course in our house, you know, so through the hallways and down the stairs, we played mini golf in the house. So we always try to come up with unique ideas. You see way. this, man? Are you listening to what Kramer's saying is you make a special effort? Yeah. You know, if you know, like my wife, Cindy, she knows she's probably going to get, get a flower at least every two or three days from me, maybe more often a wild flower brought to her. And it's the least I can do for someone who, who does so much for me, but it just lets her know that, that I cherish her, you know. By the way, did you know that golfing indoors is illegal at the Royal Hawaiian Hotel here in Hawaii? Really? Okay. Yeah, we well, used to go down and have the international indoor putting competition down the hallway of the nicest hotel in Waikiki. And uh, there were no signs that said no golfing allowed. So we just naturally I mean, assumed. I think it's legal. <laughs> yeah, that's legal. Yeah, they shut us down after the third year. We had a, uh, yeah, really tough. But that's just so cool. So you make an extra point to spend that kind of time. You know, with yeah, we yeah we do our best to, to make it happen. Sometimes it doesn't happen, and, and Lord knows I'm I'm not as perfect as I sound. You know, it's I struggle often to to say thank you for making dinner and to to recognize that man I should do the dishes tonight and all those different things. Um, but as you get older, you you know you learn to uh, to do more it and takes, more for your spouse. It, it takes work. It does to love someone. Mm. It does. It, it it's like the the children are misbehaving or need attention 
you don't yell at them across the room. You have to physically get up and go over there. And it takes it takes work to really love your spouse to look past. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it, it does. It's um, and I, I think that's that's crosses over perfectly to our spiritual life too. That it takes work. You know, like everybody says, you know, you have to have a personal relationship with Jesus. And I think most just think of that as fuzzy feelings and you know lovey dovey stuff. But no, lo- real love takes work, man. And you just you don't just fall in love with Jesus just because you say so. You got to work at it. Yeah, love isn't the Bible doesn't say God so loved the world that He got all warm and gushy inside. Yeah, and it says He, he sent His Son. Nothing. Right. He sent His yeah. Son, and mm. so w- love is a verb. It's an action verb. I love the way uh, Aquinas says love is willing the true good for the other. That's right. And then you marry yep. that to John Paul too, emphasis on on the gift of self of self donation. Love mm. is willing the true good for, through, for the other through self-donation. Mm. It isn't sitting and just saying, oh, I love you so much, which is so important. Right. Um, a lot of us uh, don't feel, I, I've, I'm going to give you 45 seconds to do this, don't feel loved by God the Father because they had a father that didn't love them. Can you yeah. talk to them for the next 30 seconds about that? Yeah, man, I that's that's really hard for me because I, I had a, a, a phenomenal father. Um but I think I think three three simple truths can can unite you to the Lord in a way that maybe you never realized is one God is real you know um, he he's alive he's real he's been real forever God loves you um, with a love that is beyond our comprehension and then three God's plan for you is perfect um, mm. so, um, all that he has in store for for you is is beyond your wildest dreams i love that statement if you can cling to those three truths uh it it drives out fear it drives out loneliness it drives out um anger it drives out everything clinging to those three truths and they are truths god is real god loves you and god's plan for you is perfect yeah there's a verse that says i know what i have in store for you plans for peace not destruction a future reserved for you full of hope and then he says if you seek me i will let you find me and then he Mm. says if you seek me with all your heart I will let you find me because C.S. Lewis says that God hides himself just enough so the person who doesn't really want to find him will never see him. But yeah. for the person who who wants to find him will see him. So seek the Lord. Seek seek out God. Go to Mass. Go to confession. It's a great place to start your relationship with God over again. We're talking with our good friend, uh, become a good friend in the last hour, Kramer Soderberg, basketball <laughs> coach, new author, fill your cup for Christ. This is, And they can find you. What's your website again? Uh, KramerSoderberg.com, um, and then you can go to Amazon, too, to find the book, either place. Uh, I would yeah. Love for them to get it. Well, thanks for spending this time with us. This is the Bear Wozniak Adventure. You can go to our website, DeepAdventure.com, and uh, also, don't forget, go to YouTube and subscribe to the Bear Wozniak channel, because this this uh, EWTN radio show is also coming to you on YouTube, and all the of course, all the other podcast formats, but if you want to see what Kramer looks like, <laughs> go to our YouTube <laughs> ugly, channel. Yeah, my ugly mug. Until next Till next week, may the breath of the Holy Spirit aloha you. Aloha. Hey, man, I don't want you to miss out on your free stuff at deepadventure.com. Go there and subscribe to our weekly email newsletter. You get free video content, including the Bear Wozniak radio show, video version on YouTube before it even airs on EWTN. And you can follow us on all of our social media. Go to deepadventure.com and subscribe. Get your free stuff. And if you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to press the subscribe button and ring that little bell. Don't miss out.